Hello, fellow marketers. Welcome to another episode of Directive R&D. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Max Serrato, who's our senior PPC specialist here at Directive, as well as our helps with marketing ops for Directive. Max, how's it going? What's going on, Dr. Bowie? Glad to be here. <laughs> Not a doctor, uh, but uh, a marketing scientist. But uh, thank you so much for joining today. So we have a fun topic for today. It you and I have gone through many trials with this, but uh, we're going to be talking about lead scoring. So some quick backstory. We moved from Marketo to HubSpot for a lot of different reasons we're not going to get into. Um, but we needed to rebuild our lead scoring model uh, to build something that's more robust. So we know we knew which leads to nurture, which ones to hand off to sales, which ones would we have more personalized uh, workflow automations for. Um, so we needed to build a new lead scoring model that makes sense. So. I'm going to share my screen to kind of go through the model that we have, and then I'll be asking Max kind of how we built it and put it all together. So adding my screen here. Max, can you see my screen all right? I'm good to go, yeah. All right. So I'm going to start off with our overview about our lifecycle stages. So uh, can you break this down a little bit for us? Yeah, so we kind of broke it down into different buckets, right? Because when we first got started with lead mm -hmm. scoring, uh, you know, it was back when we had a pretty large SDR team, but not a whole lot of inbound happening, right? A lot of our stuff was outbound based. We were working a lot with content, so we needed a way to like prioritize who to go after. Mm -hmm. um, so this score right here we have on the left, on the very left is like the HubSpot lifecycle stage. And then on the right side or in the middle there is like what they are considered in Salesforce, okay. right? So just normal contact. We have their information. They are people, you know, based off of our lead scoring, have a score of less than 15. Someone who's a lead in HubSpot is score between 15 and 99. And then here's where we would get into like prioritization, right? If, you know, SDRs were, you know, doing their outreach, they would prioritize people in the MQL stage, which would be yeah. any over a hundred. Um, and then after that, right, it's, it's less on lead scoring and more of, the action that they've taken, mm -hmm. um, right? So SAL is someone who, you know, fills out a request to have an intro call with us. Um, and, you know, they're passed directly to uh, a sales representative there. And at that point, they turn into a contact in Salesforce. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks for breaking that down. And then, um, yeah, so we chose this 100 score um, as kind of our baseline for, knowing where to prioritize. We do ask certain other details so that we can personalize our nurture based on potentially what content they're interested in. Um, but how we come up with the scores, we're gonna jump into next. There's two um, kind of main segments or buckets that we use for scoring. So I'm gonna jump into the first one, which is demographic and firmographic uh, criteria. So uh, can you break this down for me a little bit here, Max? Yeah, so what we have here is all of the different things that we're, we're looking for, right? Over the years, we've kind of figured out exactly where our sweet spot is, who we're looking for. Um, and so we assign point values to those, right? So we wanted to make sure that combined with the behavior score, you know, mm -hmm. if someone at the very minimum met the demographic score, they could MQL. Um, as long as, you know, they take a in action, right? Behavioral action that we're looking for, right? Um, so right here we have like title, job title, like maximum points, minimum points, uh, country, employees, industry tier. These are all like good, good uh, categories, I guess, that we we use in our scoring. And then we mm -hmm. on the flip side too, right? We have like disqualifiers through you know all the lead scoring and learnings we've done. What do we know that? we kind of want to avoid and we want to like instantly disqualify. Right. So you see some like specialist customer, we don't want like customer marketing people uh, mm -hmm. and interns, stuff like that. And then in terms of like industry too, right. We have certain industries that we know we don't want to uh, have sales bothering or going after, you know, maybe they're just looking more for information and it's less so on uh, like them needing our services. And this still right. isn't, a uh, perfect science, right? We still are working on this. I'm, you know, you can speak to this too, right? We, we've gone yeah. through, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different variations of this, realizing like 
And one of the things we did in the past was, you know, try and instantly disqualify people from using their, um, you know, personal email, right? And mm-hmm. but what we find is, you know, we would get these like quality leads, but because they use their personal email, it would instantly disqualify them, and you know, they wouldn't be a priority for sales, which. Right is not ideal right and when you're using all these different technologies together for example linkedin lead gen forms right whatever Mm -hmm. fails on file is the one you're going to get so we 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 had a you know did some learnings there and realizing that it's more towards i think rewarding people who are your ideal customer than you know being more aggressive trying to disqualify things that you don't want to see. But again, we're confident in these disqualifiers that we have here. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I think a lot of this is going to be sample data and we've actually evolved since this, these uh, numbers that we've had here, but for your own, for our listeners, um, you know, it will definitely depend uh, in terms of what firmographic criteria you want to reward or discount. Um, we even have some of our own unique kind of labeling of certain accounts and things like that. And um, something to take note of, of in the beginning here, we saw that MQLs had to be a HubSpot score of at least a hundred or more. Um, and what this is saying is that if you meet all the right criteria uh, based on the data we have around each lead, if they don't take a significant action, they won't become an MQL. Is that right? Yeah, that's completely correct because right. We don't want, to consider someone an MQL just for being the right person, right? We need, we need to make sure that it's, it's that balance of behavior and firmographic. Makes sense. Cool. I'm going to jump into the next tab here for behavior. Again, very sample, and it's going to vary based on, you know, company to company, strategy to strategy in terms of what uh, behaviors or interactions you track. But can you walk me through a few of these and um, that we see here? Yeah. So just like we saw with, um, you know, with the demographics on the behavior side too, we don't want to just, you know, prioritize someone and consider them an MQL just because they took an action on our site. You know, that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they could just be looking for information, but, you know, maybe a competitor or, uh, maybe, you know, a startup that's not really a good fit, but, you know, still doing their own research. So we want to make sure that one specific action doesn't automatically MQL someone. And we mm-hmm. do see here that like website get quote submitted is a hundred. So that technically is enough to hit that mm-hmm. well threshold. Right. But if they aren't the right person or their company size isn't big enough, they are going to receive those dings from our negative, uh, right. negative scores to you know, push them under that MQL threshold. So these are just kind of the actions that we deemed as valuable um, on our website and you can see it's like a mixture of, you know, marketing activity, email activity, um, visiting specific pages as Mm -hmm. well as, you know, joining our Slack group, uh, signing up for, uh, you know, a free trial of our, um, LMS, uh, software. Yeah. Uh, So there's a, there's a whole bunch of different things here that, you know, we, we want to track then that we want to contribute to, uh, our lead scoring. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, something that's always evolving, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure we've actually tracked way more than that. Like, we're in, essentially, anytime we come out with a new piece of content or mm-hmm. um, any sort of thing, any sort of new campaign, that's also being tracked uh, on our behavior scoring as well. Makes sense. Um, I know we were talking about demographics, and and some of our viewers might might be asking you how you get this information. Do you have to ask for it all or do you use enrichment or something like that? So can you speak to that a little bit on how we kind of gather that data for us and maybe for, for other people? Excellent question. Yeah, it's definitely important on the back end to have that information, that valuable information that you need to use to like analyze whether or not like a specific person is quality so you can build like a lead scoring system. And obviously having all of these questions on a form would absolutely like murder your conversion rate. (laughs) Um, So luckily for us, right? Like a lot of inbound comes from LinkedIn where you can get pretty much all this information on the back end without the user having to fill it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Something we did right for our like web forms was HubSpot uh, enriches 
uh, like company data for you. So it, it'll take like whatever the, the website, domain, right? Yeah. The website is or mm -hmm. domain and it'll take that and then it'll populate, right? The, the industry, the company size, location, uh, you know, essentially all the company information too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then I believe where we ask for like um, job title on our forms. So that's, you know, we have to ask some of the questions, some of the stuff HubSpot's not going to know, but um, you know, if you do have enrichment solutions, you know, whether it be like ClearBit, ZoomInfo, Seamless, one mm -hmm. of those, and you are able to, you know, enrich your contacts in real time, right? You, you may only need to get their, their email um, mm -hmm. in order to get all this valuable information. Um, and then another thing that you had mentioned earlier, right, was uh, we do ask questions that aren't even on here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that we use for score or that we don't even use for scoring, like you mentioned, uh, for like specific drip campaigns, um, asking what they're interested in, whether it's paid media, conversion rate optimization, search engine optimization, uh, you know, we have like a question like that just to kind of understand once we do deem that they are valuable and they are an MQL and we want to, you know, start reaching out to them and sending them, you know, relevant uh, email content that we, mm -hmm. we have information already. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, same thing goes for knowing what level they are and it just adds more dimension to your content strategy and your nurture strategy. So I'm going to jump out of this sheet here um, really quickly. But yeah, thanks so much for all that really valuable information. Um, is there anything that you know our viewers can do to keep getting better at, at this process that you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, it, it's constant tweaking. Um, it's not just a set and forget. Uh, it's got to be something that you're constantly looking at um, and analyzing. Um, and then being cognizant of the fact that when you change your lead scoring model, mm -hmm everything is affected, right? Yeah. It's a big shift for us with HubSpot, right? We've, we, this is probably our third or fourth different <laughs> model that we, we've been through, right? Cause we're always learning. We're always, you know, getting better and tinkering with it. But, you know, one of the, one of the first things we realized once we changed was people, I, I want to say our old MQL threshold was like 50 points and we scored everything differently. Yeah. So we, we upped that to a hundred right? There were still people who were below a hundred, but who had already been marked as an MQL and you can't go backwards in yeah. the stage, right? HubSpot's not automatically going to see that and be like, Oh, the criteria has changed. Now we got to change this person. I won't do that. Um, so, you know, for reporting and everything, right. When we're pulling a end of quarter, like, Oh, MQL report, look how many we got. Yeah. Really, you know, you, you, <laughs> you got to make sure that you're, adjusting your criteria to, um, yeah. to meet what the, what the new scoring model is. And then, um, you are able to like manually go in and HubSpot and, you know, clear that life cycle stage, uh, to get a fresh start, but, uh, just know that it's not going to automatically do it for you. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think something we've learned is just to make sure everyone's aware of the changes from your team and sales, and you're all on the same page when you're coming up with this model in the first place. That's probably the most important thing. And then making sure that if you're making any changes, you note it and everyone understands that when looking back. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for the valuable information. Um, I'll be, if you want an example of this sheet that you can copy, I'll be um, dropping a comment in and feel free to reach out if you want it, a sample. But thank you, Max, for all that information and for joining us. As always, please leave any comments if you have any questions and we'll see you on the next one. So yeah, thank you.